And we're back after a five week break. Blue Eagle 40's back. And well, as you can see, the set looks a lot different now. Uh, a lot cooler, if you ask me. And for our first guest, after a lengthy five week break that started with the FIBA and then all these uh, typhoons coming up, our first guest after that is the first player of this current Blue Eagle team, Chris Newsom. Chris, welcome hey. to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, Chris, actually, a lot of fans, uh, Ateneo and non-Ateneo fans, have been clamoring for you to be on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, being the top rookie, one of the top rookies right now in the UAP. Chris, um, for the past couple of years, you were serving your out your residency. That's right. What was it like for you watching from a distance, watching from the stands, watching Greg, Keith, Ryan, and all the other guys play, play hoops? Uh, of course it was tough because uh, as a basketball player, uh, you never want to be able to put uh, to be put in these situations where you can do absolutely nothing about it because right. you're just you know it's not your time yet uh, so you're just sitting there and all you can do is watch um, you know I practice daily every day with these guys and uh, I was happy when they got the five feet because you know I felt like uh, I could help them with maybe in practice pushing them a little more even though uh, I'm not there in the games but you know pushing them to be able to get ready for their opponent. So uh, I took that as my role during my two-year residency uh, to help the team any way possible to, you know, get ready for their next opponent, so. Right. I understand you also played on Team B. How yeah, was it for you? I also played on Team B. Playing on Team B was a, a really good experience because uh, from coming to the, the U.S. To, to the Philippines, of course, it's a different style of basketball. And uh, playing on Team B actually helped with that transition. Right. Uh, I had Coach Yuri, so uh, he was he was really really good in, mm -hmm. in breaking me into the game and showing me uh, the little things about the game uh, through Team B, so that whenever it is time on Team A, that uh, I'll be ready. You talked about coming over from the U.S. How mm -hmm. did that happen? Were you recruited, or were you just like Googling and surfing uh, Philippine basketball? Uh, it, was a it was actually a little bit of both. What actually happened was that when I graduated high school. Uh, one of the college coaches that was recruiting me for New Mexico Highlands, who, who I played for, uh, he found out I was half Filipino, and then he also knew some people out here. So what happened is that we, we kept the option open to either play uh, the Division II college or to try to come out here in the Philippines. So that was nice of him. Huh? Yeah, it was really nice of him, you know, because he, he saw that, uh, there's opportunity for maybe, you know, beyond college or, or you know, just better off uh, for my career out here. So I commend him for that. Yeah. That's right. He wasn't just looking short term, but long term right, also right, for long you. Long term. So I uh, definitely give him a lot of credit for that because uh, without him and, you know, making uh, a few phone calls and putting together a, a scouting tape on YouTube so some coaches can see it, uh, yeah, none of this really would have been a possibility. And then... Uh, we were fortunate enough, me and my dad, actually, to uh, be able to come out here. Uh, I think that was in 2010. And then uh, that's actually whenever uh, we, we went to UP, we, uh -huh. we came here. Uh -huh. uh, we, you know, saw a couple PBA games, right. and talking text, and uh, who else did we see? J just a couple PBA teams, and then we were able to uh, find out what was better for me from there. Let's give your co coach this credit. What's his name? Mm -hmm. Oh, Joe Harge from New Mexico Highlands University. Coach Joe, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so how did you find your way to Ateneo? Uh, well, uh, I was practi I was actually at a, one of Talking Texas practice here at Moro, and uh, at the time, you know, Coach Norman was the uh -huh. coach, and he, he was also a consultant. So what happened is uh, he also invited me, because I was 19, he invited me to uh, come to Ateneo practice. And so I came to two of those and, you know, saw the team, saw the guys, and everybody was really welcoming. Uh, Kirk Long, one of the one of the few that you know actually came un, uh, up to me and you know talked to me a little bit about what it was like to play here at Ateneo. So uh, and then after that, I was fortunate enough to see a Ateneo Lasalle game. You know, I was here that that time of year, and me and my dad went to so Ateneo Lasalle. That. So that was my first UAP game, and yeah, I was <laughs> basically sold on that. Did yeah. anyone try to recruit you of, away from Ateneo? Uh, no, the only other team that had interest was UP so okay. uh, either way I was going to be here on Katipun man. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay your first UAP season is it all that you expected or is it more than that uh, it's actually a little 
a little more than what I expected because uh, it's a different perspective from sitting behind the bench, like like we were saying, two years, and actually being out there because uh, behind the bench you you see everything that's going on. You could see all the things that happen in the crowd, and uh, actually being out there on the court, you're more in tune, in focus mm -hmm. onto you know the game plan, and, uh, what what's going on, what every player is doing, and uh, coaching strategies uh, to even maybe social media, you know, you see all your pictures right, right. And, and people talking about you and things like that. So uh, it's definitely a lot more than I expected. Just uh, being able to even go out and, you know, people having pictures with me because, like, I'm actually out there now and not just, you know, somebody that has potential of being uh -huh. a basketball player and good, things like good. that. That's nice. You talked about, you mentioned being in tune with the game. Mm -hmm. How is it that whether you score in a dunk or a three-point play, your facial expression never changes <laughs> during a game? How do you uh, keep that icy, cool, calm, and in, even in the most pressure-packed situations? Honestly, for me, it's more of a... It's not really a show for me. It's just go out there and uh, take care of the things you need to take care of. Do what you got to do. If you make a three, uh, I'm not one of those guys that are just... You know, passionate yeah, to, to, to the point where I, yeah. that, right? I mean, sure that that happens in uh, really, really tight games or games where there's like a lot of energy. But for me to to just keep your composure and you just got to stay focused because sure that you made that three, but that that don't mean all that would be taken away if uh, they come down and hit a three pointer. And so that's right. So it's better to just, you know, hit the shot or, or get the dunk, sure, but then you also have responsibilities to get back on defense and stop them from scoring. So, uh, yeah, get that play over with and just move on to the next. That's that's kind of my motto. Okay. You talked about Kirk Long. Kirk Long for Ateneo was known as a defensive stopper. You've mm -hmm. come in and replaced that, mm -hmm. uh, replaced Kirk with those defensive chores. But is it difficult transitioning from defense to offense? It seems that you have no problem moving in you know, um, moving back and forth. Yeah, I I have been labeled as uh, basically the defensive stopper or the the latest one since Kirk. Um, you know, seeing that it's it's been working for Ateneo. You right. know, those are the things that have won us those championships. So of course we need to continue to have that on our team in order to uh, continue to be successful. So if I have the ability to do it then uh, I'm going to do my best to do that because that'll be the best way I could help this team out. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. transitioning into offense, that's just, a, that's just a natural thing for me because, of course, everybody can, can you know, run the floor and, and score easy layups and things like that. But uh, that's where I try to take my advantage because I'm sure I can get the rebound and I can get up the court. So uh, if maybe the four is guarding me, we'll have that advantage because he might not be able to run with me. Right. Or maybe uh, I can challenge him to, uh, to, to take a bad shot to where we can get the rebound and outlet. And, you know, that's just easy points for us. So uh, it's definitely something that I feel we need to do and continue to do on this team because, um, you know, if we try to settle in the half court, it's going to be a lot tougher for us, especially against bigger teams. Uh, for example, LaSalle or, uh -huh. or NU. NU, thing. that's right. You know, in uh, Ateneo fans out there, even basketball fans, in Blue Eagle history, before we've had Rich Alvarez play the power forward position. And Rich was not only the, the defensive stopper on that, on that Blue Eagle team that won a championship in 2002, he also would bring down the ball very much mm -hmm. like you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you relish that opportunity for Coach Bo to ask you to run the offense, sometimes the offense fun is funneled right through you, mm -hmm. whether through Wami, of course, through Wami also, to, through Kiefer and Ryan. Mm -hmm. But there are times you bring down that ball and you facilitate the offense. Mm -hmm. How actually, do you feel about that opportunity? Uh, I don't mind, actually, because uh, back in the States, this is going you know, back into my history, is that uh, I used to be a point guard. And naturally, for my coach, Joe Harge, uh, he had me as a point guard. and. Uh, being with him, he taught me a lot of things uh, mentally about the game. Of that, you know, if you have a, if you have a mismatch, mm -hmm. you should be able to locate that mismatch and right. exploit it as fast as you can. You know, just one second, you should already know. So that's kind of an instinct for me to to bring down the ball, and in a way, I feel like that's how I could help 
others uh, get their their options. For instance, Kiefer, everybody knows Kiefer can score, mm -hmm. so they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on him. So if I have the ball and I'm able to create and suck in the defense, that leaves Kiefer for an easier shot, or or Ryan or Wami, uh, Elorde, for instance. So that's kind of where how I think about it. Maybe not necessarily I have to bring down the ball because I'm going to be the one scoring, but I feel like I could draw a lot of attention so that others can be open. If they're not open, I still have that ability to uh, try to make things happen and score for myself. Okay, two more questions before we talk about uh, the Ateneo LaSalle game. Okay. You were, uh, I thought you were going to be playing for CNAG, the CNAG national mm -hmm. team in 2011 during the mm -hmm. C Games. What happened there? Uh, actually, what happened was that I was still working on my, uh, my passport, right. my paperwork and things okay. like that. So. Uh, they had me on the, the team, they had me on the roster, and we were just waiting for my passport and paperwork to be finished, and unfortunately, it wasn't finished in time. Wow. But uh, missed out on that opportunity, but they still they still did good. You know, they still came home with the gold, but uh, it was still a, a good opportunity for me to even be at the practices and, uh, you know, just be a part of that for a little bit, even though I didn't get to go to the tournament, but it's just good exposure at the time. That was still within my first year, so mm -hmm. you know, for that to happen within my first year, so I find that pretty, pretty good, and definitely interested if the opportunity comes up again to to be a part of something like that. Okay, what about the, those alley oops? Um, <laughs> do you practice that with Keith, with Wami, and all that? We do. Uh, whenever, whenever we have time, or we're just messing around, maybe uh, after practice or between our breaks or something uh -huh. like that. Uh, everybody would just try to go out there and dunk, and I mean, everybody knows that I could jump, so uh, we, we just have fun throwing the ball to each other. Sometimes I'll throw it to Keith, or even sometimes I'll throw it up to Wami so he <laughs> can, you know, get a try in there. But, uh, yeah, just, you know, that's something that we do kind of unconsciously now because, right. you know, it's just all in fun whenever it's in practice. And then uh, when it comes to the games, you know, that unconscious effort, you know, can just come out and make something great happen. Uh -huh. You know, it seems that after, uh, during every Ateneo game, fans are looking out for that one, that, that, yeah, one, that one connection right there yeah. for you to throw it down. Mm -hmm. How does it feel when you hear the crowd roar after that slam? Uh, it's, it's unbelievable, actually. It's just to, to have everybody just go out, go out and uh, go crazy over that one play. Uh -huh. It's just, you know, something that a lot of people dream of. Right. But, uh, of course, that's not... It's not the only thing that's on my of mind course, to just of course, uh, yeah, yeah, get right. those, you know, highlight plays and stuff like that. There's a lot more to the game than just those plays, but of course, it's those those plays that could, uh, you know, change the momentum of games or maybe add that final exclamation point to to say, hey, you guys aren't coming coming to, coming back to beat us or, or something like that. Right. Okay. Let's move on to the Ateneo Lasalle game. All right. The day after. What's the day after like for you? Uh, a little bittersweet because, uh, of course, it was it was right there. It was a good game. It was a close game. Um, there's there's a lot of things that you know we did throughout that game that I feel we could have did better. Uh, of course, it's not just coming down to one play. Jaron Tang hit that that shot over me. You know, it was a good shot. Thought I had it, but uh, it was just a great shot by him. You might want to. Um People want to know what was what was discussed in the locker room without giving anything away. What was it like after the match? After the match, uh, actually, everybody was was positive because um, there wasn't too many too many people that were just like. Of course, everybody was heartbroken that right, that we right. lost, but we have to keep moving. You right. know, we, if we if we har harp on this loss, that it's just gonna eat us up inside. So, uh, you know, everybody was positive, saying, "Hey." We're gonna learn from this, you know, because it, it's not too late. Uh, it's just one game, so we got three games remaining. Mm -hmm. You know, we finish these three games, and we'll have our momentum back going into the playoffs. So, uh, yeah, just basically the, the the attitude in the locker room is just to stay positive. During the summer, we played pretty well, and we only ended up with two losses: mm -hmm. one in the Father Martin's Cup against NU, and in the Phil Oil that was against USD. Mm -hmm. Leading up to the UAP, Kiefer got injured. Mm -hmm. Then Boy got re-injured his knee in the field. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it? Then th you were playing a lot of minutes. Ryan was playing a lot of minutes. Right. So was Wami. Uh, at first, it was really difficult because uh, those are pieces that we had that 
help us play together and play well because it's what we know. And then with the unexpected injury to Kiefer, uh, of course, that forces other people to step up. So in a way, uh, we were kind of searching in our team for, for who those people are uh, in the absence of Kiefer. And in uh, regards to Poi, his injuries, we, we all know he's coming off of ACL and uh, then he re-injured it, you know, during mm -hmm. Philo. Yeah. And that's just, that's tough. But then, you know, we, we told him also to, to take, take his time because it's not necessarily that we need him now at the beginning of the season, but we need him when it matters most, you know, at the end of the season. So that's kind of how we approached it for Poi. You know, we gave him his time because those those things you can't rush or else you could re-injure it and it could end up, you know, a million times worse where he could be done for the season. That's right. Uh, same same for G-Boy and uh, Chris Porter. Uh -huh. You know, it's, uh, two guys We lost that, all our bigs. Yeah, lost all, a lot of bigs. Uh, it forced me to play the, uh, the big for a while, so... Um, it's just one of those unfortunate things that happened, you know, the, the injury bug that came and hit our team. But uh, I think our team did very, very well of holding its poise whenever it came to those type of things. Uh, you know, a lot of other teams I don't think could have handled it the way that we did. Or That's true. In fact, uh, even during that first week when Kiefer got injured against mm -hmm. FU, we were in the fight until the final That's minute right. of play, right? And so, with the overtime. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, Yesterday against LaSalle, um, I, I talked about this offline with you, and I asked, uh, does it bother you when, the, when, when the or at least from the team's point of view, when the calls aren't going your way? What's going on on your minds so when you c pull yourselves on the huddle in the court, you know the calls aren't going your way? What happens is that um, we, we know that the, the calls might not be going our right, way, right. but we feel that we could still persevere through all that we could still there's a, there's a bright spot that could be shown in all of that that definitely we could fight through that we can handle that adversity you know same thing like I was saying with the injuries right we, we had to fight through that mm -hmm. if, if the refs are uh, maybe calling a bad game we can fight through that and we can still win and that's what we don't mind proving to people is that through all of this that, that happens all these X factors that we still have the desire and we still put forth <coughs> the, the, the heart yeah. to go out there and just give it our give it our all right um, and that's that shows a lot you know beyond just the, the winning and losing because that shows that you know you have players that you know will go all out all right. out regardless of who's against them or what people say and that that's something that uh, it's really really hard to find uh, teams that can keep their composure and things like that. Um, uh, situations like that, or when when things get really really hard, then you find out who who you are. Here's a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. Tall teams like Lasalle, UE, they like to make the most out of their height. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 is the game plan? Again, without giving anything away, when you go up against tall teams, mm -hmm. like that. Uh, basically, when we go up against tall teams, we know that they're gonna try to bang us inside. Yes. So. What we're gonna, what we try to do is that we want them to. We don't mind them banging inside uh, at all because if they, they <coughs> have bigs, as long as they're not finishing at 60, 70 percent, mm -hmm. then we're fine with that. We get them to like shoot like yesterday, right? We get them to shoot 25 percent. Uh, we get those rebounds with their bigs down there in the in the paint. We get the rebound, the quick outlet. That should be a fast break for us because our bigs can run the floor. Mm -hmm. So we want to play a fast game when it, when it comes to, to uh, bigger lineups. Right. Uh, you know, trying to, trying to guard us, or we're trying to guard them. We did that against Adam Sun We did that in against the first round. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And they were the top rebounding team at the time. Top rebounding team. And uh, yeah, our going off rebounds, it's upon a lot of our guards because you know, our big men have their hands full. So their main job really is don't let him get the rebound, don't let Sewa get the rebound, don't let, you know, Torres get the rebound, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is good. It's commendable for, for Frank. Actually, I think he's very underrated because Oh definitely. Because he does a lot of those intangibles. The dirty work too. The dirty work. So maybe I might get fourteen rebounds, but what they don't what a lot of people might not notice is that maybe seven of those came from tip outs from Frank. 
or him boxing, or out, him his boxing man, out his man for you to get rebound. For me to get rebound. That's definitely. right. So yeah. I definitely feel that uh, that's one underrated aspect of uh, the game for our team. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, in a game against LaSalle, uh, it for the f prior to that we played FU where mm -hmm. you were practically hitting everything mm -hmm. from ev almost everywhere. Were you f was the team thinking like, wow, we gotta save some of this stuff for the next game against LaSalle? I mean, I want to give. I'm gonna give some credit to LaSalle for their mm -hmm. defense, but not entirely, because we were missing a lot of op wide open, open shot. shots that yeah. the guys would normally make. Yeah, that's right. Um, actually, I, I feel that we we weren't really thinking about LaSalle whenever it was the FU game because oh, of course, we of we tried to think about just what's the task at hand. Definitely. And then when it came down to LaSalle, I just feel that uh, maybe the guys were a little bit. A little tight, just because of the, the occasion. Right. You know, the occasion tends to do that. So we just had a a, a really, really balls-out game against FU, mm -hmm. and to come out and try to do that again, that's it's very hard to do because, one, LaSalle was preparing for that because they just saw what happened. So uh -huh. uh, they knew that we like to get out in fast breaks, so mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily have everybody crashing the boards. Uh, they would send... What two? I saw maybe two or three going back every time in transition. Just to prevent the transition, just to, yeah, yeah. Just to prevent that. So they they did a good job with that. But for us, yeah, it was just uh, staying staying mentally focused on trying to hit those shots. And the thing is that if we if we're not hitting those shots, we got to find other ways to to make things happen. Um, maybe we're having an off night because right. it could happen in the playoffs or, or a finals game or something like that. You're having an off night, but we got to find other ways to score. Chris, we're coming a little closer. The first round, we lost by uh, a, a little bigger margin than mm -hmm. yesterday, mm -hmm. just by two points. Do you think we're getting better? We're getting there? Yeah, we're definitely getting better. Um, this loss doesn't mean that we're, we're a bad team. For sure. Yeah. This loss yeah. doesn't mean that at all. Um, if anything, what this loss teaches us is that we could learn from this mm -hmm. because all these little things are happening right now. And okay. I would rather much have that happen now than later, than later on in the season. Yeah. So uh, if anything, it, it's a reality check for us that uh, sure we were on a five game streak, but mm -hmm. that's telling us that we can't stop. Uh -huh. You know, we just got to keep working hard and we got to, you know, keep putting in that extra time in practice to, to get extra shots. So uh, we won't have another slump like we did. Uh, to you know, do keep doing our defensive drills and and just all the the little things that that we have to keep working on. That, that this is a sign telling us that okay. we got to push even harder. So, last question, Chris. We're facing UE for the next game. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts on that one? They beat us in the first round mm -hmm. during the summer. We we pretty much handled them. Uh, your thoughts about the upcoming match and how big it is for us? Yeah, uh, UE's a good team. Uh, they they. St have been surprising a lot of people. Uh -huh. Well, not necessarily surprising because they did win the the, the preseason. So, right. uh, but they're very unpredictable because you never know. They might be down, you know, 15, 20, but they could still they're come, come back. <laughs> you know, they're going to yeah. fight back, especially with uh, Mammy in there. You know, he and Sumang there. And Sumang, you know, yeah. he's been a fourth quarter guy for them. So, mm -hmm. uh, for us, I I feel like we're just going to have to uh, make everybody else beat us. You know, Sumang, he's going to try to get his. So uh, for as long as we make him take bad shots, we have to get those rebounds. And that's what happened last game. If uh, Sumang was taking bad shots or, or he was missing his shots, but yet Miami would get the, the offensive rebound and get those two points right back. So uh, we just have to capitalize on, on things like that. And I feel like we would be able to get this win over UE. Okay, Chris, uh, we're at the end of our show. We want you to invite the fans out there to come out and watch the game, that very, very important game against oh, yeah. UE, and to continue supporting the team, of course. Yep, yep. Everybody, please uh, come out and show your support. You know, we're still in this. We're still going for, for the 6 P. It's still alive. So, Definitely, yeah, uh, yeah. Come out and, you know, show your support for our last push to uh, win this, this year. All right. You so there right. you have it. There you have it. Uh, Chris Newsom. Uh, our first guest after that lengthy break here in Blue Eagle 40. Next week, when we come back, we're going to be talking about that UE game and a win. 
so keep it right here. thank you very much for watching. thank you for